and I want to talk to you today about the Indus submarine fan and the sediment records that we find uh, there and, um, and, and how we interpret this to reflect the growth of the mountains, of the Himalayas, the Karakoram, and of course the Asian monsoon. There we go, there we go, oh, okay. So, um, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the monsoon is of course the seasonal climate, the, um, the variation it, between the dry winter uh, climate and the wet summer rains. Um, and you can see here on this uh, map, uh, the rains are along, particularly focused here along the Himalayan front, along the Western Ghats of the Indian Peninsula. And of course, in Southeast Asia, in Myanmar and Peninsula Malaysia, as well as parts of southern China and Vietnam. So one of the strange things about the monsoon is that um, that it's a, essentially a reversal of the usual uh, situation that we see in um, in in Asian in weather systems in other parts of the world, where we see uh, maximum heating at the equator and then rising. Uh, rising air and precipitation in the equatorial regions. And then we see dry air subsiding in the mid latitudes in places like Africa, where the rainforests are in the equator. And we have things like the, um, the Sahara Desert in the north in the mid latitudes. But of course, in Asia, we, there's a reversal of this. In Asia, the high heating is in the mid latitudes and the precipitation uh, is in the mid latitudes in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And the the return flow, uh, this re the return flow is at the equator, which is yes not not what we're used to in other parts of the world. And of course, the uh, this climatic situation develops because of uh, the topography of Asia, and in particularly the growth of the Tibetan plateau. Uh, and this idea that as the sun is shining on the surface of the plateau, that this causes hot air to rise in the summertime and it creates a, um, a low pressure system, which draws the moist air from the Indian Ocean or the Pacific Ocean in Southeast Asia, but it, from the ocean and it precipitates against the mountain front. Uh, more, more recently, people have been suggesting that the South Asian monsoon is more sensitive to the height of the Himalayas and is less affected by the Tibetan plateau, that it's the barrier of the Himalayas, which is allowing the hot air to develop over essentially the Indo-Gangetic floodplains, and that this is what the tr primary long-term driver of monsoon intensity in South Asia. So what do we know about the history of the Asian monsoon? Um, we know that uh, it may be affected by, um, it may go back into the Paleocene, the Paleogene at least, uh, and that it may also be affected by areas of shallow seas in Central Asia. In particular, here you can see this map um, where the gray values show the high topography. And you can see this little outline here, uh, This is the shallow seas of the Paratetis. This map below here, this is the last marine bed here that was ever uh, the youngest marine bed found in the Western Tarim Basin over here in Western China. And it's believed that the retreat of these seas may also be important in making the monsoon strong, uh, probably around the end of the Oligocene. Uh, and of course, for many years now, people have talked about some of the paleoclimate records from onshore in, in Pakistan and Northwest India. Uh, this well-known study from Jay Quaid and colleagues who were looking at the Shualiks uh, up here um, in, in North, Northern Pakistan, where we saw this transition, particularly in terms of um, carbon isotopes that start around 8 million years ago. And that was interpreted to reflect this change in the vegetation between um, uh, C3 uh, trees, essentially, and grassland, the C4 vegetation. And at the time, that was interpreted to reflect uh, the onset of the monsoon. And that seemed to make some type of sense because of what we knew about the marine geology of the Arabian Sea. So drilling by ocean drilling program offshore uh, Arabia here 
and they recovered a cause that contained this foraminifer, the uh, Globigerina boloides. And in 1991, Dick Kroon, then at the University of Amsterdam, showed us that that Boloides became much more uh, common in the cause so around, after around nine million, uh, around eight million years ago, it was quite strong. And so since this uh, blooming of this uh, foram, which is associated with monsoon driven upwelling uh, in the modern oceans, that he suggested, therefore, that the monsoon should be becoming strong around that time. And uh, certainly, we, they, we believe that the monsoon, uh, the, the upwelling and the productivity would increase at that, that time. But of course, the Loides is not really controlled by um, by rainfall, but instead by wind. And indeed, uh, other wind related proxies uh, in the Indian Ocean uh, include more recent work that was done in the Maldives um, a few years ago now, about five, six years ago now by um, IODP. Uh, they drilled in the carbonate platforms of the Maldives and what they showed is this extremely dramatic um, seismic profile which they were able to drill and date. So here they, what they're looking at is a wind blown drift of carbonate sediment, a drift deposit here. And you can see it becomes really strong, very pronounced change after about 12.9 million, potentially with some type of uh, system actually going back maybe as into beyond about 21 million, but a big change here at 13, essentially 13 million years ago. So there is some controversy, as you can see, about the age of the monsoon. When does it start? Maybe it started in the Eocene. Did it then get stronger at 25 or at 13 or at 8 million? And how does that relate to the building of the mountains? Um, as I mentioned before, we expect the strengthening of the monsoon to be to occur as the mountains get bigger. Um, and uh, in contra and and in reverse, uh, it is suggested that the that the precipitation of the monsoon against the southern flank of the plateau, particularly in the Himalaya, these are pictures of monsoon clouds here um, near Manali in northern India. Uh, the idea here is that stronger rainfall in this area drives erosion and allows deep buried rocks, uh, metamorphic and igneous rocks that were produced under the under the Tibetan plateau to flow to the surface uh, in what was called then this channel flow model. The, and so in this way, you can see how the monsoon can interact both. It's caused and strengthened by the by the monsoon rains. Um, sorry, by the uplift of the plateau, but in turn, the monsoon itself influences the mountains. And uh, about 12 years ago, 13 years ago now, I published this paper that m tried to make this link, where we used a long-term chemical weathering record from southern China, uh, going back to about 24 million years ago. And uh, what the idea was that stronger chemical weathering would be associated with hotter, wetter conditions, more like a monsoon. And so what we saw was an, essentially an increase in the starting in the early Miocene and reaching a maximum in the middle Miocene, and then decreasing with time, getting drier. And it was interesting that this record from the South China Sea actually had the same general geometry as one that I generated from offshore Pakistan, from a drill site uh, called Indus Marine A1. It was an oil exploration well in the Arabian Sea and it also shows this maximum in the middle Miocene and then a decrease. Which was interesting since how far Arabian Sea is from South China Sea. And we see a similar type of uh, approach here in the Bay of Bengal again with high values here in the middle and into the late Miocene. And then you can see starting after around 8 million years ago, there's a decrease. So the idea was that the rainfall would be strong in the middle Miocene and then get weaker into the Pliocene. And what was interesting is when you look at the rate of sediment delivery into the Arabian Sea, into the Indus fan that we were able to construct from, um, uh, from seismic data, that this also seemed to show this type of um, pattern where we have 
weaker and then it gets stronger stronger rates of sediment delivery probably caused by faster erosion and then getting weaker through time so this supported the idea that when the monsoon rains are strong you get rapid erosion and we and that material is then being swept out into the arabian sea and deposited in the submarine fan and uh, this general pattern also supported uh, the channel flow type models right so these are argon argon dates from the greater himalaya uh, and the associated foreland basin so it's it's um, slightly messy, but what you can see is an increasing during the early Miocene and then a number of peaks here during the mid Miocene and then a decrease. So this suggested that the greater Himalayas were cooling very quickly in the middle Miocene at the same time that the erosion was strong and when the monsoon rains were strong. So it seemed to suggest that the monsoon was um, critical in driving that unroofing the exhumation of the greater Himalayas and that as the monsoon gets weaker in the late Miocene that that exhumation slows down. So one question you might ask yourself is well if that's true then why but why does the monsoon get strong in the middle Miocene anyway? Well one uh, piece of work I've done over the last few years with my colleague Alex Webb from the University of Hong Kong was suggesting that much of this may be driven by the break off of the subducting Indian slab. So this is a, like a cartoon. You can imagine the Himalayas are following this blue line on the left. Uh, and here the Indian plate is coming below Tibet. Essentially, we, we've made Tibet invisible here. And that the slab is beginning to tear both from the east, from the Namche Bawa Eastern syntaxes and from the Western Nangapaba syntaxes. And that as this breaks off, this large weight is removed and the, eventually then the plate is able to rebound and that pushes up the high ranges. And we see this both in terms the tearing of the slab is manifested both in magmatism in Tibet, the cooling ages of rocks along the fault, and in fact also in the foreland basin. So this is a compilation of data I did in the short in the foreland basin looking at both zircon fission track and argon argon muscovite ages in the sediments. And what you can see, we've color coded this so that the, the western, the west is basically red and the east is dark blue. And then the middle, the middle is this green, light green sort of color. And in particular, if you look at the zircon data, what you can see here is that the red ones, essentially Pakistan and Northwest India, a lot of these zircon ages are quite old essentially and as you move to younger and younger ages uh, we see a peak that the youngest ages here both in muscovite and in zircon are actually the ones in the central part of the himalaya essentially uh, nepal and lhasa that part of the two so it seemed like the exhumation of the mountains is basically oldest at the western and eastern ends of the Himalaya and youngest in the middle. And that was consistent with the idea of this slab break off. So we proposed that it was the breaking off of the slab which pushes the Himalayas up starting well around 20, 25 to 20 million years ago. And it's this rapid rising of the, of the Himalaya which is causing the monsoon to get stronger and the rain to intensify at that time. So of course we'd like to look at this in greater detail and particularly to make better temporal correlations and in, to, in order to do that we have to be able to link, uh, understand how the sediment is moving from the mountains into the Arabian Sea. So we need to know these are the Greater Himalaya, this is Dharamsala, uh, and you can imagine the sands coming off these high peaks here uh, in uh, here in Northwest India and in Pakistan, that they eventually, of course, make their way into the Arabian Sea. This is the Indus submarine canyon offshore Karachi. So we wanted to know a little bit about, or we want to know a lot about how sediment moves from these mountains all the way into the deep ocean. What can we learn from the oceanic record? So 
we do know that the sediment doesn't move directly from the sources into the ocean. We know that in some places it's stored. So, for example, in the Sutledge Valley, um, here, a German group uh, under the uh, leadership of Bodo Buchhagen showed that there were a number of terraces in, along the Sutledge Valley and that when they dated these, they could see that the valley is filling up with sediment uh, when the monsoon is strong and then when the monsoon becomes weaker, the terraces get cut. So the storage and supply of the sediment is modulated by the strength of the monsoon. And that means that some of the sediment in the modern river is coming out of quite old terraces um, that maybe have stored sediment for 10,000 years or more. And we also know this is happening in other parts of the mountains as well. So uh, in Ladakh, for example, um, here I had a PhD student um, who worked here in the Zanskar Basin, so the greater Himalayas are to the south, uh, and Zanskar is essentially drain draining the north side of the greater Himalaya. And what she found was that the age of incision, again, was a little bit like what Buchhagen found in the wetter parts of the Sutledge, that we had sediment filling the valleys 10, 11,000 years ago, and then the river is cutting that after that time. The same was also true when we looked at the floodplain. So uh, this was work I did with Liviu Giosan, my Romanian colleague from Woods Hole. And what Liviu showed was that uh, actually in the western parts of the Ganges system, but particularly in the Indus Basin, we see how the rivers are incising their own floodplains and that this starts about 10,000 years ago. Right? So the penny plains in between the big rivers, the Jhelum, the Chenab, the Ravi, the Satluj, that these are accreting, but after 10,000 years, the floodplains are being uh, eroded and cannibalized. But, but only in the north, right? In southern Pakistan, that's not true. So we do know that there's quite a lot of recycling of material, and we know that this has been subsequently being delivered into the ocean. Um, so, but we, we are aware of the fact that the Indus fan itself hasn't really been active for about 11,000 years. So work that was done by a Dutch group uh, that cored the fan, they showed that the last sort of active sedimentation on the upper fan was about 10, 11,000 years ago. And that's pretty normal, uh, what you would expect in, at a time of rising sea levels. What was interesting is that later on, we cored along the submarine canyon and were able to show that the canyon has actually, the canyon itself is remains active through the sea level rising and high stand period. So that we show that in the right here. So this is a plot of water depth against age. And what you can see is that actually several of the sites in relatively deep water, about one, but almost around a kilometer of water depth, actually remain active all the way through the Holocene. So even though sea level essentially stops rising after around 7,000 years ago, sedimentation in the fan has been continuous, sorry, not in the fan, in the canyon, is continuous through that time, albeit mostly quite fine-grained material with relatively small turbidites. So where does that sediment come from? Is that being recycled or is that delivered directly from the river? So we looked at that a little bit with two, two methods. If you look at the one on the right, this is strontium and neodymium isotopes. What's interesting to see here is that uh, the Indus River essentially has two end member comp compositions. Uh, the glacial maximum and shortly after that, it has relatively low strontium 87, 86 values. And more recently, it has relatively high values. The neodymium doesn't change so much. So what's interesting is, although on the western shelf, uh, west of the Indus Canyon, on the Pakistan Indus shelf, we get these gray uh, dots show that we're getting mixing with material from the west, that the canyon itself is depositing sediment that looks exactly like the Indus River. Right? So that suggests, and the modern Indus River, not the old one, 
So the sediment is not being reworked. It's essentially being delivered relatively directly from the river mouth. So there is a, a, con a direct connection there between the river mouth and the deep water record. So that's particularly in relation to fine grain sediment. So the, the situation is more complicated if you want to look at the sand. So um, on the left here, these colorful pie diagrams uh, show you the results of zircon dating that was done on the cores in the submarine canyon. And so basically we have a plot here with older and younger ages going vertically. And then essentially there's the river mouth on the left of the diagram. And as we go to the right, it's further offshore. So each of these colors represents a group and age population of zircons that are related to particular source areas. Uh, the blues are Himalayan sediments. But what I want you to particularly note here is that the material deposit of the river mouth is actually sort of different from what we see in the submarine fan and the canyon at the same time, right? The lower parts of the canyon. So here, for example, 6.6 thousand years ago, the river mouth has a lot of material from the Karakorum, this yellow stuff here. But at the same time in the canyon, uh, we actually see very little material like that. So this gave us the idea that the sediment that's coming out of the Indus River, uh, the sand may be being deposited here in the river mouth or close to the river mouth in a kleiner form on the shelf. But the mud may be moving further offshore, either as hypopycnal plumes or as low density turbidites that are still going into the canyon, but maybe not as far as the submarine fan itself. And so most recently, myself and my student, my former student, Tara Janelle, have been uh, making a budget. In fact, this it says in review, uh, that's not really true. It's now in press, uh, sorry, published Earth Science Reviews 2021. And what we tried to do was to make a budget for the present Indus River. Where is the sediment going, coming from and where is it going to? So by far the most, 75% of the sediment is coming out of bedrock erosion or the remobilization of glacial moraines. There's a little bit coming about 11% is coming out of the floodplains in the northern parts of the of the Indus uh, floodplain. Uh, some of it may be going in and out of the tar desert as well. That's a relatively large unknown. And then essentially relatively small amounts, around 3% is coming out of uh, big large scale rock slides in the Karakoram, as well as another two and a half percent out of the terraces I showed you. But they're not very important. So of that material that's reaching the river mouth, the lower reaches, uh, about half of it is going into the uh, alluvial plain in Sindh and into the delta plain. And the other half is going into these shelf clinoforms. There's a big eastern clinoform and a much smaller western clinoform. And essentially very little is going into the canyon and nothing is going into the fan. So in contrast, however, of course, that means that all the sediment that we see in the Arabian Sea must be coming, must be being deposited there during the glacial times. And so we made another budget here for the Indus during the glacial times. So at that point, of course, most of the sediment is coming into the Indus fan. There's a little bit is going to be stored on the shelf edge. And at that point, we are getting recycling of the sediment from the clinoforms, from the Kutch and the eastern western clinoforms, uh, but still with a significant amount of material coming from onshore. Again, the recycling of the alluvial plain and the dissection of the delta. So in this case, actually, most of the sediment, about 75% of the sediment being deposited in the fan, is actually recycled from the previous warm period when the monsoon is strong, not, not the glacial time when the monsoon is weak. So the, the turbidites themselves are deposited during low stands, but they may be, but they are reflecting erosion that happened before that, when the climate was more moderate and the monsoon was strong. So what we su suggest is therefore that the marine record is offset, right? So the 
uh, the, the turbidites are not reflecting the climatic conditions at the time of their sedimentation, but instead they represent the climatic conditions at the time they were eroded. So we did try to look at this in greater detail and over longer timescales through drilling by IODP in 20, 20, 20, 2015 in the Lakshmi Basin here, essentially offshore Mumbai. Uh, and uh, we were able to drill at two sites here, um, both of them located to the west, sorry, the east of the Lakshmi Ridge. Uh, this one right on the edge of Lakshmi Ridge and one closer into the middle of the basin here, 1456 here. And we were uh, attempting to drill a long-term erosional record uh, for the Indus fan. Um, so, what? yeah, particularly we really wanted to drill a long section through the Indus submarine fan. And for many years I had been trying to get IODP to drill on the Murray Ridge because I think that's a better place to look. Um, but we were not successful, partly because of the threat of piracy. Um, so in the end, they decided that they would drill the Lakshmi Basin, uh, which is, of course, somewhat on the edge of the fan. Um, but at least we have some significant thickness of sediment there, much less than we see uh, in the proximal areas. This is just offshore Pakistan here. So what we got when we drilled this was two sections, 1457 and 1456, that go back to around 11 million years ago. And so there are some unconformities in the section. Um, and uh, broadly speaking, these are comparable to uh, sedimentation in parts of the Shualik group. Uh, but interestingly, of course, this record still uh, passes through the climatic transition, the, the one that we showed earlier, the drying uh, that Jay Quaid and friends found in the, uh, in the Shualiks, as well as, of course, the strengthening of the upwelling uh, offshore Oman. So we hoped that we would be able to see some impact of the climate change on the sediments. And in particular, in terms of chemical weathering response. So as I'm sure you know, you know, if you have a dry climate, as opposed to a wet one, you get a whole different type of soil. Um, you know, in a, a wet climate, you may get thick laterites and hematite being deposited in a, in a dry environment, you're going to get a different type of material. And so this sediment, these soils are then eroded and put into the deep ocean. And uh, so we should be able to tell the difference uh, and use this to constrain what the environment was like in the Indus Basin. So uh, pardon, this is rather a complicated diagram, but what you're looking at here are two sets of chemical weathering proxies. So on the right, on the left here, we see chem uh, chemistry, right? Potassium, aluminum, the chemical index of alteration, and then on the on the right we have clay minerals, um, and we picked these ratios to be environmentally sensitive. So what I want to note is that particularly in the starting in the middle Miocene, we see a decrease in chemical weathering. So you know, al uh, potassium is more water mobile than aluminium. So when chemical weathering becomes stronger, you get less potassium aluminum, and therefore lower potassium. Sorry, yes lower potassium aluminum uh, and likewise for the chemical index of alteration. So what we see here is a decrease in chemical weathering during the middle Miocene. At the same time, the clay mineral shows something similar. We're looking at decreasing amounts of illite crystal crystallinity, lower amounts of kaolinite, which is a, a chemical weathering uh, proxy. Uh, and then this ratio, the kaolinite smectite, was essentially a race designed to give us an understanding about how um, how tropical versus seasonal the weather was. So here we see a decreasing, it becomes less tropical essentially, more seasonal, which is consistent with a strong seasonal monsoon climate. But overall, it suggests that the chemical weathering in the Indus Basin is becoming less. Uh, at, at the same time that the 
that the climatic transition seen in the Foreland Basin was occurring. And also, of course, a time of global cooling. So it seems like the climate is getting wetter, sorry, drier and colder, and that this would be consistent with the reduced amounts of chemical weathering we see in the core. Of course, we can only make this uh, interpretation if we're sure where the sediment is coming from. It has to be from the Indus Basin and not, say, a change between the Indus and, say, rivers in peninsular India. So to, to understand where the sediment is coming from, we use neodymium isotopes because they're not affected by chemical weathering. And as you see, the different source regions of the Himalayas um, have, or the different source regions of the Indus River, have quite contrasting values in this isotope. So here, the, like the lesser Himalayas has this very negative epsilon neodymium value, uh, peaking around minus 25. The greater or high Himalayas are, lower, uh, are higher than that, they're about minus 15. Then we see the Karakoram, Koistan, sorry, Karakoram are about minus 10. And then the trans Himalaya, including Koistan, has positive values between zero and 10. So what do we see when we look in the submarine fan? Well, or at least in the Lakshmi Basin. So what we see uh, here is, um, well, let's look at the cross plot first, epsilon near dimium against strontium. So the new data we have are these blue dots here. And what you see is actually they plot actually quite close to the, uh, the Indus Marine A1, which is near the Indus Delta. They actually the green field here is the is the quaternary, the Holocene Delta. So these our sediments in the Arabian Sea show relatively similar values to that, and that's suggestive that it is the Indi it is the uh, it is the Indus River which is producing these sediments. They're not coming from Peninsular India, like the Deccan Plateau, for example, has much more ne much more positive near epsilon near dimium values. We don't see anything like that here. So if we look at the long-term variations in neodymium through time, uh, basically all, we get a 17 million year record by putting data from Indus Marine A1 here, along with the new data from IODP. And what we see is essentially a gradual increase in epsilon values between 17 and about 10 million years ago. And that suggests more and more erosion of the Karakoram. And then starting after around 7 million years ago, we see more lower, lower values, more negative values, suggestive of more erosion from the Himalaya. And that's particularly true after around 4 million years ago. You see the values really drop at that time. So some years ago now, I thought that that was related to um, to drainage capture, but that turns out to be probably not correct. So we can look at this a little bit more carefully if we consider um, zircon uranium lead dating of sand grains, of zircon sand grains in those sediments. And like the neodymium, the different source areas of the Himalayas have different characteristics. The greater and Tethian Himalaya share this one billion year old zircon age Although the Tethian appears to have this 500 million year spike that the other ones do not. And then the lesser Himalaya, especially the inner lesser Himalaya, should have a much older spike about, at about 1.8, 1.9 million. Billion, I say. And, and of course, in contrast to that, the Karakoram and Koistan have very, very young ages. So it should be quite easy to tell the difference between the lesser Himalaya greater in Tethian and the Karakoram. So this is what we saw when we tried to do this. These are called kernel density estimate diagrams, uh, and they, um, they show us that, um, so these, let me see, all right. Yes, surrounded by the red here, 
what we see is that these are the sediments from the Indus Fan itself, from the Laxmi Basin. And what we can, what we see is that the old ones have lots and lots of this very young peak. So this suggests erosion from the Karakoram or, uh, and or from Karistan. It's interesting that the pink shaded units, which are like the Greater or Tethian Himalaya, we actually don't see a lot of that material for quite a long time. It comes in much stronger further up here. And particularly that yellow shaded peak here that we associate with the lesser Himalayas really only begins to show up about 1.9 million years ago, relatively recently. So what does that mean? What this means is that the, that the Indus River appears to have been, it becomes more Himalayan through time. You can see this on this so-called multi-dimensional scalar diagram. This is a, a visual, it's like a principal component analysis of these spectra on the right. And the, in red, I show the different sources here. So the modern river plots over here, along with some of the youngest sediments, right? The 1.6 and 0.9 million year old material. So they all look quite similar. And they are relatively close to these Himalayan sources, especially the greater and Tethian Himalaya. But if you look and the older samples, the older samples are plotting over here, much more to the right and closer to the Karakoram. So it looks like there's been a progression here between from relatively Karakoram rich sediment towards relatively Himalaya rich sediment in the present day, which is consistent with that neodymium isotope record. It's also consistent with some of these structural reconstructions of people like Alex Webb. Uh, here, this is from the, um, I think this, this is from Northwest India, from the uh, Kangra embayment. Uh, and what he's particularly showing here is the development of the duplex in the lesser Himalayas that occurs after around 5.4, but before 1.9 million years ago. And you see that Alex is only suggesting that the purple, the inner lesser Himalaya, is only coming to the surface relatively recently, about two million years ago. And, and that's actually consistent with what we see in the submarine fan, right? So that's why this little spike doesn't appear earlier, because essentially the, let the inner lesser Himalaya are not exposed at that time. At least then not much of them are exposed. And um, maybe we also need to consider a little bit about the role of Nanga Parbat. So a lot of sedimentologists and tectonics people are, have long debated the role that Nanga Parbat plays in supplying sediment to the Indus. And that's mostly because um, in the eastern Himalaya, um, Namche Bawa is believed to supply as much as 70% of the sediment in the Brahmaputra. So the open question was, well, does the Indus do the same thing? Maybe the Indus is essentially um, deriving all its sediment from Nanga Parbat. We do know that this is suffering extremely rapid uplift and very rapid exhumation. So the real question is, does it dominate the sediment record? So we were fortunate in that uh, my colleague Anwar Alisai from the Geological Survey of Pakistan acquired for us some sediments from these places from Taito and from Gorikot on the east side of Nangaparbat. That's the peak of Nangaparbat here. And again, we looked at them with, um, with uh, uranium lead zircon ages. Now, what was interesting is that especially Gorikar and even Taito have a significant older uh, population here at 1.8, just like the lesser Himalayas. And that's consistent with the idea that Nanga Parbat itself is a piece of the lesser Himalaya. It's part of the old basement of the Indian plate being uh, subducted under Tibet. However, when you look at the Indus River, both upstream of Nanga Parbat, so this is, uh, let me see, um, yeah, well, this is Auchi, that's in uh, Ladakh. Uh, but we see essentially there is no old, there are no old grains at Auchi. We don't get grains from the Hunza or Gilgit rivers here. 
or from the Karakoram. And it's interesting, downstream of Nanga Parbat at Atok Bridge here, just downstream of the Tarbella Dam, the modern Indus River has actually very little of this material. So this suggests to us quite strongly that Nanga Parbat, or at least the rivers from Gorikot and Taito, do not make a big contribution of sediment to the river. In fact, again, this is one of these MDS diagrams, the Atok which is in the middle here, a red looking thing here. Atok looks somewhat like the Karakoram and a bit like Taito, but, but not dominantly, right? So again, the pi diagram show the result of our quantitative assessment of where the zircons are coming from. So if you look at this, the Gorikot and Taito in blue and yellow here take up about, well, around 30% of the zircon population. But the rest of it is coming out of, mostly out of the Karakoram or Trans Himalaya. And in fact, it's probably much less than that. It's not 30%, it's probably a lot less than that, because the sediments that we looked at from Nanga Parva show that, um, that they have relatively high concentrations of zircon. So the sources in Nanga Parva are disproportionately. Uh, influencing the zircon budget. And when we correct for that, you can see that Nanga Parva accounts for just a couple of percent of the sediment at Atok Bridge, and even less, of course, entering the Arabian Sea. Um, what this means is that the young grains that we saw in the, in, the, in, in the Indus Canyon that I showed you earlier, which we thought were from Nanga Parva, are actually probably from the Karakoram. So what this really means is that Nanga Parvat is actually quite different from Namche Bawa, that it is not a big source of sediment to the Indus River. The Arabian Sea is not filled up with Nanga Parvat material. Uh, and what the reason for that is, is probably related much to the climate. So whereas Namche Bawa has a very strong uh, monsoon and lots of erosion modulated by this, of course, northern Pakistan is quite dry and we don't see a strong uh, erosion. And so the, ocean, the sediments in the Indian Ocean do not reflect the rapid uplift of Nanga Parva. So this is sort of a little summary diagram trying to show how the long term development of the climate and the mountains and the erosion work together. So what we can see is that the erosion of the greater Himalayas is fastest in the mid Miocene when the erosion is strong and when the monsoon is quite strong. And then starting about 8 million years ago, the climate is getting weaker, that we have more grasses and less trees. The, 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 the climate gets drier, but also therefore the Himalayan erosion slows down. We get less sediment being delivered and the, the bedrock themselves are eroding more slowly. And at the same time, the river is becoming much more dominated by erosion from its eastern tributaries and the Himalayas, right here, particularly starting about six, seven million years ago and very strongly around three or four million years ago. When we try to do a quantitative unmixing of this, we can try and instead of you see these, this model here uh, shows you the different zircon populations, but we can use those to model uh, where the sediment is coming from over geological time. And this is the result of that, um, where we see essentially in green here is the Karakoram. So, you know, eight million years ago, a lot of the sediment is coming from the Karakoram. And as we approach the modern day, that's getting smaller and smaller. And the, instead, the greater and Tethian Himalaya are representing more and more of the sediment reaching the Arabian Sea. So why is that? Part of it is related to uh, the, the monsoon, although it's not entirely clear why the Himalayas would erode more when the monsoon is getting weaker which is the opposite of what we see during the glacial times. Uh, and then, of course, some of it may be simply relating to the uplift and unroofing of the, particularly of the lesser Himalaya, which have this very distinctive signature. 
So what I hope I was able to show you here was a little bit of information, what we've learned about the Indus River and its uh, v various depot centers through time. So we see that monsoon started to intensify after about 24 million years ago. And that's probably caused as a result of the Indian slab tearing off and dropping back into the upper mantle. And that pushes up the Himalayas and makes the monsoon stronger. Uh, I didn't really talk about that, actually, but the idea that global um, global temperatures might be modulated by Himalayan erosion appears to be not the case because the weathering is becoming less strong through time, not more strong. But we, uh, what we do see is that the periods of strong rains are associated with strong erosion and also with the exhumation of the Greater Himalayas, which stops about 16, 17 million years ago. Yes, more recently, the drilling here shows that a combination of neodymium and zircon data show more erosion for, from the Himalayas starting shortly after six million years, but particularly after three, two or three million years. And this, uh, this is not related to Nangapava. It is the Lesser Himalayas, it's not Nangapava. What's causing that? Well, uh, it's not so easy to correlate this with the uh, onset of the monsoon or the weakening of the monsoon. It is possible that as the monsoon gets weaker, the rain front is retreating south out of the high ranges and focusing more in the Lesser Himalayas where we see it today. Um, the other an alternative which we prefer at the moment is the idea that the tectonic imbrication of the Lesser Himalaya in its duplex is pushing up the range front and allowing orographic precipitation to be preferentially focused there. So it's more, although the, Him the high Himalayas appear to be climatically modulated, the Lesser Himalayas appear to be much more strongly controlled by the solid earth. Oops. Oh, oh, and if you're interested in topics like this, you might like to know about an ongoing seminar series, um, Monsoon Geo Seminars, which you, this website, you can look at this. If you want to be to receive a weekly email about what's going on, you just you send me an email and I, I will add you to the list and we can. Uh, and if you've missed talks, you can look at them on YouTube. Uh, there are quite a lot of talks on YouTube now about this topic of erosion and climate change and the monsoon available. Ah, that's sort of a little bit irrelevant. So what I'm going to do is I'll stop now and then um, if there's any questions, I will be happy to take them. Thank you very much.